Cause the eyes of the ranger are upon you Any wrong you do, he's gonna see When you're in Texas, look behind you Cause that's where the ranger's gonna be All right, we're gonna head to College Station and talk about the Texas A&M Aggies entering year number three in the SEC. You might remember year number one. I don't think anybody out there could have expected 11-2 and two in your freshman quarterback named Johnny Manziel won the Heisman Trophy. Um, of course, it was kept off that year with a route over my Sooners in the uh, Cotton Bowl. Two years ago, A&M exceeded expectations, but was too much put on them too soon as far as um, setting the bar for last season. Um, last season, they did win nine ball ballgames. Um, offensively, they were at the top or near the top of many categories uh, c countrywide, certainly conference, you know, wise, probably the best offense, in, you know, in, in the SEC. And that's saying a lot. Um, but as a and found out, uh, it takes more than just averaging 44 points per contest to be a um, high caliber team. Okay. They were good last year, but not great. And defense was a big, big reason why we'll talk about it a little bit, but offensively, um, thanks in part to Johnny football, but also thanks I really thought to an Offensive line, they didn't get near the credit they deserved. Um, entering this year, of course, you don't have Manziel, but you do have four of your five offensive linemen back. And I don't care, you know, what people what people say about Johnny Manziel. You know, he was one heck of a quarterback at A&M his two years there. He doesn't become this legend if it weren't for that offensive line. Um, Jake Matthews, just like Johnny, uh, first-round draft pick, you know, We'll talk about Mike Evans in a second because, you know, he got picked two in the draft um, pretty highly. Offensive line, one of the best in football, okay, for A&M. And they return nearly everybody. They lose Jake Matthews but return the rest. Uh, now Cedric Oboihe, who was a guard when he started there at A&M, right tackle last year, moves to the left side this year. Um, the other tackle will be occupied by a Jermaine Ifedi. So you have him back and you have – a. Another player, a guard, and uh, Jarvis Harrison, and Mike Matthews at center. Backfield for A&M, you know, quarterback, and the ground game should be just fine as long as these starters stay healthy for A&M. Speaking of the ground game, A&M's ground game will, you know, really have a chance to show what they can do because, you know, a lot of A&M's offense was, was based upon, let's face it, um, Manziel's ability to improvise, ability to, to, you know, kind of create as the uh, play progressed. And sometimes that involved Manziel running the ball. So now the, the ground games, I don't think they're going to ever try to make Kenny Hill or Kyle Allen a um, a Johnny Manziel type player. Um, and you'd be a fool to do that, even though it'll be pretty much the same kind of offensive formation from what I've been gathering on my research. Looking at the ground attack, look for Trey Carson to have a nice year. Carson, um, he started his career with Oregon, but then transferred to A&M not long ago. Last year for the Aggies, five yards a carry. So I would expect him to be the number one guy. And then backing them up, the Williams. You have Trey Williams, who had over 400 yards on the ground a year ago. And the ex-Sooner in Brandon Williams, who had nearly 300 on the ground. So there is, you know, quality backups there for uh, Trey Carson. Quarterback, well, who gets to fill in the shoes of JM? Well, Kenny Hill looks like we'll get the start. Hill, a sophomore, um, you know, played a little mop-up time last year. But, but by and large, um, on the sideline. So he gets the nod over freshman Kyle Allen, but I do expect Allen to play as well. The receivers, you're going to miss Mike Evans. And, and you know, sometimes like the old saying, you know, receivers make a quarterback look terrific. And there's no question last year that Evans really made Menzel look terrific at times. All-American from a year ago, high draft pick. Um, you will miss Mike Evans. It'll give an opportunity, though, for some underclassmen to shine. Um, Ricky Seals-Jones. This guy um, has a chance to really be something. They redshirted him last year, so now he gets a shot to show what he could do. True freshman in the form of, and this is a great football name, everybody. How about this? Speedy Noyle. Speedy Noyle, that's his name, true freshman. He's projected to be a starter along with Malcolm Kennedy, uh, the lone senior of the four guys I'm mentioning, and the fourth is uh, Josh Reynolds. So um, A&M will still spread it out. They'll still use four receivers at times. I would expect A&M's offense to continue to be effective. It just might be done in a different facet. Defensively, oh, my goodness. Okay, we talked about how good the offense was a year ago for A&M. I'm going to put this way about the defense, okay, in contrast. I have a nine-year-old son, 
And I would be more tempted to have him go to a theater, sit on the front row, and watch the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and also the next movie, watch the original Halloween without leaving the theater at any time or going to the bathroom. I'd rather him sit and watch that for a total of four, four and a half hours than have him watch a three to three and a half hour uh, display of the 2013 Texas A&M Aggie defense, okay? It's that simple because last season, A&M's defense really made any horror show that you've ever seen, even the classics, look like a G-rated Disney movie in comparison. It, it was that gruesome to watch. Extremely graphic. Um, don't recommend it. It was that bad. How bad was it? To show you I'm not exaggerating, they gave up an average of 32 points per game. They gave up over 220 yards on the ground per contest and per game, 475 yards a contest. How can you possibly win the SEC when your defense is giving up that many yards? I don't care how good your offense is. You're asking your team to win in pinball fashion every time, you know, lighting up the scoreboard like crazy. For the offense, they did their part. For the most part, the defense stunk up the joint. I know that they were pretty young in a lot of areas last year, and I know the injuries can happen, but the defense will get better this year just because I don't really think they can get any worse. I really don't, okay? And in Kevin Sumlin's defense, they have recruited better uh, since joining the SEC. They, they have. I mean, they've got the facilities um, upgraded even more. They'll be able to see even more at Kyle Field. And because they play in the SEC, that is a huge recruiting uh, weapon line against any nearby school that a and is recruiting against. Um, because SEC, you know, gets so many players in the NFL. And of course, you know, four or five star high school players, that's what they want to hear. That's what uh, they want to be proven. And the SEC has proven that with how many pros they've gotten into the um, NFL. But getting back to the defense now, uh, defensive line, it stinks that they will not have Isaiah Golden. He was going to be a starter, but got in trouble. Um, he got in trouble during the offseason on more than one occasion. So Kevin Semlin had to dismiss him and another projected starter, the linebacker, uh, Darian Claiborne, who did not even play because of troubles off the field against uh, Duke. So you're without Claiborne, you're without Golden. So you have seven starters back instead of nine. Defensive line-wise, uh, they'll really count on a uh, former five-star recruit in Miles Garrett. You also have Deshaun Hall. And defensive end, uh, one of the bright spots for A&M is uh, Julian um, obi Oha. So you'll have him. And speaking of linebackers, uh, you'll have at the strong side, Donnie Bads, and at the weak side, A.J. Hilliard. Again, a lot of these A&M players played a year ago, um, but you're kind of learning on the fly. You're learning as you go, and hopefully for them, they've gotten better conditioning during the offseason, but hopefully wisdom and uh, knowledge is, is where, if you're an A&M fan, you're hopeful, you know, along with last year's experience, that they have improved immensely. We'll see. The backfield, as far as the defense goes, uh, DeShazor Everett, um, he did some good things last year for them. Had the interception run back for a touchdown against Arkansas when the game was tight in the second half. So he's an impactful player. The safeties, Howard Matthews, as well as uh, Floyd Raven, um, you'll have them too. But AM defensively, the big thing is you gotta, got to get some three and outs, or at the very least, you got to force more punts, and we just did not see that enough in 2013. Special teams shouldn't be a problem at all. Uh, you return uh, Drew Kayser, averaged well over 47 yards per boom, so no problems there, and Josh Lambeau is a reliable kicker. The schedule for A&M, their non-conference schedule, once again, is ridiculously easy, so they should have four conference wins, uh, you know, pretty much right there in the win column. Lamar, Rice, they'll play them in early September. And also there's a matchup against Louisiana Monroe in early November. And you also uh, have another showdown coming up. Um, forgot about the September 20 matchup in Dallas against SMU. So those are four wins, but a and season doesn't start with any of them. It starts with a conference game, and it is a rotten way to start your year at Columbia, South Carolina against a top-10 team in the Gamecocks. And you play them on a Thursday night on the SEC uh, network, a new network by ESPN, and a and will be a massive underdog in that game, although Mike Davis, their great running back, may not play in that game, so that won't hurt a ms cause for an upset. Um, you play at Ole Miss. Um, actually, this year you host Ole Miss. You go to Mississippi State, and there's also showdowns. The latter part of the year is really where to watch the schedule. Um, at Auburn in November, on November 8th, the 15th, you host Missouri. That's a swing game right there. 
And can A&M do good things on offense against LSU? Last two years, LSU's played them. They've been able to contain A&M fairly well. They held them to 10 points last year at Baton Rouge. But that November 27th game on Turkey Day, that will be um, at College Station. Best case scenario for A&M could be a 9-3 and three season. I just don't see them beating South Carolina or either Alabama or Auburn. However, um, the other nine games are winnable. Even that LSU game, if they can finally find some way uh, to get some consistency on offense right there. You're getting them at the end of the year, so that will not hurt. Um, worst case scenario, it could be a 5-7 and seven season if the defense continues to get gouged, if the quarterback play is really uh, not where it should be. Obviously, Hill and Allen are not you know, Johnny football, but they need to be serviceable. They need to play consistent. If they can't do that, um, it's going to have an effect on the rest of the team. And A&M could very well lose games at the beginning of the year you thought they could win. Likely scenario, I'm going 7-5 and five and a tie for fifth in the West, in the SEC West, the toughest division in college football. And um, I got 3-5 and five in league play, tied for fifth, and 7-5 and five overall. And I think next year, probably the year after that, with the recruits that someone is getting, uh, this year's, uh, which will be mediocre by a &M standards, it's just temporary. And I do think that they will be back to contending in the SEC West. This year, though, they're going to take their share of licks. That's my look at A&M. Talk to you soon.